I was reminded that you and your work was somewhat involved with George Cahill. And I, 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 I can't quite remember. I think I may have found some of his studies through listening to you on the mm -hmm. Peter Atia The Drive podcast where you referenced it. Right. But can yeah. you talk a little bit about what it was like to work with him and some of the things that you guys were studying? Well, you know, uh, George had a, had an incredible knowledge of um, human physiology. And uh, his group, he was the head of the Joslin Diabetes Center down here in Boston. And uh, for years, he had studied um, energy metabolism in, in people, uh, especially in people that were fasted. And he wrote many of the seminal articles on starvation in man. And he and I, when we had a chance to be together and talk it deeply about the concepts. Um, you know, I learned so much uh, from him regarding ketone energy metabolism and um, how, how humans can, how long they can go uh, without eating. He, he also relayed to us the information that he collected at the Mays prison camp in Northern Ireland, where Bobby Sands and 10 of the uh, other I young Irishmen uh, starved themselves to death. And um, Cahill, Cahill told me that, um, and these were young Irishmen, and they died with water only anywhere from, I don't know, 65 to 85, 90 days of age without, without any food. Um, but he, he, he said, you know, up until 40 days, uh, uh, no water is, or no food is good. You, your body has a very healthy response to calorie restriction or what we call water only fasting. But then there's a threshold that passes, depending on the amount of body fat that the person would have, um, a threshold passes where it then becomes very pathological. And he even relayed to me a, a situation where one of the people that were in that group apparently uh, wanted to change his mind, but even infusion of metabolites and nutrients was unable to stop the momentum of the body's capacity for self-digestion. And he said the last muscle to go was the diaphragm, and which controls our breathing, the muscle that allows oxygen to come into the lungs. And these, these starved guys were drowning in their own body fluids. So starvation is an extremely horrific way to die for anyone. But Cahill went through the path from therapeutic value, uh, processes from fasting to the pathological consequences of starvation. So it is a transition. And it depends on how much body fat you have as to how long you can go. Because he starved some guy from the post office. And he, he was very candid in his stories uh, about the various people that he would fast. Um, and I guess uh, he's got this one guy, he lost his job from the post office. I weighed like 400 pounds. And he lost 230 pounds in just under a year. Uh, and he looked great and he was doing well. And there was a, the other documented case is that guy, a Angus Barberi from, um, from Scotland, who even went longer uh, with the, is, because the, your, body, your body stores energy. We evolved as a species to store energy, mainly because the foods that we ate uh, had, had very, there were lean meats and vegetables and you know, whatever we could find. So we were in a constant ketotic state. Um, so any glucose that we could get from any source would be immediately stored if possible, either as glycogen or low, maybe even fat, because most of our ancestors were not fat. You know, they didn't, obesity was probably non-existent in the Neolithic period. That's in right. the paleo, in the paleo, I should say the Paleolithic period. Um, so, so we are supremely designed through evolutionary biology to store energy. Uh, the problem is over a short, relatively short 10,000 year period, we went from millions of years or at least 2 million years in a starved state to in a, in a, in a state where high processed carb foods are everywhere. Makes perfect sense. The obesity, when, whenever you see these the, uh, obese people walking around, that's evolution in action. Those people had the, the, they had the research, they were the survivors of these starved periods. And now their ancestors having the same composition are storing so much energy, the body rarely excretes glucose. If you have type one diabetes or sometimes type two diabetes, rarely does the body excrete glucose. 
it stores glucose in the form of fat. You, that's why you can't get fat eating fat. You get fat eating sugar. I mean, a lot of people don't understand this. Low fat, low fat means you're going to get really fat on that diet because it has high carbohydrates. This that's mentality right. has been driven into us by Ansel Keys and a variety of other people telling us that eating fat food, making, eating us, making us fat, you get fat from fat. No, you don't. You get fat from sugar. And sugar is a, a commodity, a metabolite that was always in short supply in our evolutionary past, okay? But now when you have so much sugar, you create systemic inflammation and you have a linkage of, of this to all the major chronic diseases, cancer, diabetes, Alzheimer's disease, um, all of these different diseases, cardiovascular disease, mental, emotional disorders, uh, almost everything that you can think of in form of a chronic disease is in some way linked to an abnormal uh, body metabolism initiated by excessive amounts of sugar, uh, yeah, highly, yeah. Uh, high fructose corn syrup and glucose and all this kind of stuff. There's no wonder. It shouldn't be surprising that we have an uh, obesity epidemic. We're, 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 we're geared to want sugar because it was our form of storage for glycogen for the muscles. So if a tiger was chasing you, you could blast off pretty quick. So muscle can, muscle holds its own sugar. It doesn't share, but uh, anything excess is stored as fat and fat can be mobilized for energy. Like, like Cahill said, these starved people can go, if you're fat, you can go a long time without food. You know, yeah. so, uh, so anyway, we would have these very, very interesting and involved uh, discussions about his vast knowledge of what the physiological changes were in the human body during the process of fasting, therapeutic fasting and starvation. So yeah. they were, they, and he had blood work and he had all these anecdotal reports and it was just, you couldn't help but be enthralled by what he was saying uh, in so these cases. Fascinating. Yeah, so, and then Bud Veach also fill, uh, you know, did a lot of the um, um, biochemical mechanisms by which all this was happening. So to have, to have Richard Veach and George Cahill uh, in, in here talking to my students for hours uh, and giving lectures, I mean, it was just unbelievable. So when I wrote papers, I, I used to run the stuff by Veach and Cahill to make sure I wasn't making any mistakes. So I, I had the two most knowledgeable people on the planet looking at things that I, I would write and I would run it by them first. And I, if they said, no, 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 this change this, or no, you gotta be careful with that, or uh, I would learn from them. So when I published these papers, they actually had the eyes of Veach and Cahill uh, that had examined this information. So if people say, I don't know what I was talking about, well, they don't know because I talked to the two gurus that knew. And I learned, I learned from them. And wow. you need to learn from people that understand things. And, uh, and have evidence and, and worked in the fields. And then you learn from them. And then you begin to see what they told you in, 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 in reality when you're working on this. What so, an amazing point. I love that. So I have to tell you, I, I should never have found low carbohydrate in ketogenic diets. I'm a personal trainer, but I had the advantage of working on a metabolic cart for over a decade. So I was measuring people's metabolic rates at rest and as they were exercising. And so over time, I started to learn that as we change the nutrition, we can change how the body is using different fuel sources. And at yeah. the time that I was really starting to dive more into low carbohydrate diets and their effect on the bodies on one of the on one of the graphs that we would show people we would show them how their bodies would store energy we'd have a column that would say here's how many calories of carbohydrates your body stores for most men we assume that was about 2000 calories and then we would show them how much fat they were storing and that was based on their body fat percentage extrapolated to how many calories of fuel was there and you're right like if somebody was lean even they would have tens of thousands of calories of fat available for the body. And if somebody was obese, that could be 400,000, 500,000, huge, huge numbers. But I would, I would look at these numbers and I would say like, okay, well, I know you can run most of the tissues on fat. There's other tissues that you can't run on fat. So seemingly the only other source would be these carbohydrates, but these carbohydrates are going to run out at some point. It's a finite number. And, and it was Cahill's I think it was the 40 day starvation study that showed how the fuel partitioning would change over time. And yeah. it completely blew my mind. It was so fascinating. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, when you take in large amounts of fat, like on a ketogenic <clears throat> diet, you, you either burn the fat on the spot or, or you excrete it. Okay. You can't store that. What you can store is the, if you have triglycerides, the uh, glycerol backbone, uh, 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 the glycerol, two, gl two glycerol backbones can be 
uh, synthesized into a glucose molecule in the liver. And so you can, you can through the process of gluconeogenesis, but you have to burn energy to make uh, glucose. You, to conjugate two gl glycerol molecules takes energy. So you get, you get energy, uh, uh, you are using some energy to, to synthesize the glucose. It's not like drinking uh, a, a, a sugar drink, you know, where you have all this, we didn't earn anything in that sugar drink. You didn't use any of your own uh, met metabolites. But, but yeah, so we, we usually see an excretion uh, of fat. We, we, did some, we did a study, we haven't published it, but we fed the mice the ketogenic diet uh, and we, did, we analyzed all the lipids in the diet before we fed it to them. And then their fecal pellets would turn like kind of whitish. And we isolated and purified the lipids from the fecal pellets of the mouse. And the pattern of, of lipids was like card almost the same. Uh, so in one end, out the other. So uh, you, now they can get fat on ketogenic diets if you give, allow them to eat it at libidum. Like some, some if you have a little flavoring in there, I mean, but there again, you have so many thousands of calories coming into the body. So uh, humans, if they eat ketogenic diets, usually uh, fat will um, sensitize the eighth cranial nerve, the vagus nerve, which has appetite suppressant. So uh, through the hormone cholecystokinin. So humans eating a lot of fat, you know, they, oh, I don't, you know, they, I'm full, I don't want any more and, you know, this kind of thing. Sometimes the mouse will not, uh, they're, they're kind of driven. Uh, and again, it depends on the composition of the diet. Some mice will eat ad libitum, but lose weight, which is what humans do. And then other, other ketogenic diets, commercially prepared, sometimes taste good. And the mouse will pound down that stuff and get fat and get very sick. Um, so people, people have to understand it has to be uh, a regulated uh, amount of food. Um, and, and I think uh, Jeff Volick at Ohio State is doing a lot of these same kinds of studies, working with extreme athletes and looking at the, the types of metabolites from ketogenic diets and this kind of stuff. But it's a fascinating field and we're learning more and more about it. And, uh, um, you know, as we publish more papers and look at the effects on various diseases and outcomes of, uh, of uh, performance, uh, we'll begin to learn more and more about this. But right now we have an obesity epidemic, uh, which is creating massive amounts of sick people through various amounts of chronic diseases. And I think uh, the education to manage that needs to get out. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I think back even on the nutrition certification I have to pass every two years, if that if some of that Cahill information would have been included in my textbook, like that, that's such a game changer. As you're learning how the body is keto adapting, the different tissues are using ketones preferentially, the need for gluconeogenesis, like you said, is actually going down drastically. So you don't even need that much of it. You know, in, in this textbook, it tells me keto uh, uh, gluconeogenesis is a swear word. It means you're taking up muscle tissue and, and getting rid of it. And I've never seen that happen when somebody is keto adapted. And, and it was those studies that helped me understand that. Fascinating. Yeah, well, that's the thing that, I mean, our fat storages are designed to give us energy without targeting our muscle mass. And uh, because we need the muscle, to, to, it's a survival organ. Uh, liver, liver does not burn ketones. They make, it makes ketones, but it can burn fatty acids. So uh, the liver can get energy from fatty acids and also uses the fatty acids to make ketone bodies. So uh, our body is a supreme um, machine. Uh, every organ in the body works in unison with the other organs. Uh, brain, uh, uh, there's a tremendous brain gut relationship, uh, liver, kidneys, they all work together. And uh, you know, when one organ goes bad, you, know, you have these repercussions throughout the body leading to uh, uh, problems in other organ systems. In other words, you, you lose metabolic homeostasis. It's an entire organism driven uh, pro, uh, uh, event or new um, uh, environment. So your, your metabolic environment internally changes dramatically. But we evolved to do that. As I said, we're a starved species. During the ice ages and stuff, guys were there. You know, they would find ways, their ingenuity to find food in the in these different places. Um, Eskimos, I mean, look at that; those guys eating fat and blubber every day. I mean, uh, they survived really well. No cardiovascular disease, no cancer, none of these kinds. Of, all these crazy things that we have today are the the results of a Western diet and lifestyle, and it's killing us. <laughs> 